Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to take a minute to discuss one of the biggest assumptions we make in evaluation that seems to be a pretty divided topic. And that's what to use as your discount rate. And there seems to be two primary camps for this, using WAC and then using a hurdle rate. So first, let's just start with what the discount rate is. Well, the discount rate, it's the rate you use to discount your calculated future cash flows to the present value, which is ultimately going to drive the underlying valuation of the company. Some people will swear by using WAC, which is the basically academic approach, and it primarily relies on CAPM, the capital asset pricing model, to calculate the cost of equity. And this was developed in the 1960s, and it was really a way to calculate a company's required return on equity based off a handful of market drivers. So it relies on a few key assumptions, the first one being the risk-free rate. Most people will use the current treasury yield. Most people will use the 10 or the 30-year then we need to, the expected return on the market. This is the second big assumption. So usually we'll use the S&P as kind of the index and what we expect the market to return. And there's different ways to look at this. You could look at the past year's return. You could look at the past decade. You could look at the history of the S&P. You could look at what you expect the future return to be. It's a little bit subjective. And then the last thing we need is the company's beta. And if you're not familiar with beta, it's basically how sensitive or volatile the underlying stock is in comparison to the broader market. So if the S&P 500 moves 1%, is your stock going to move 1.5%, half a percent, match it at 1%? Whatever that kind of movement is with the S&P will be its beta. So if it moved 1.5% for every 1% the market moved, that'd be a 1.5 beta. If you moved a half percent and the market moved 1%, that'd be a 0.5 beta. And so what it really is, is beta is it's the variance of the market over a specific period of time, the return, like the average return over a specific period of time, divided by the covariance of the market and the security you're looking at. Most people will use a five-year monthly beta, but once again, this can cause issues if you're looking at a new IPO, right? And they only have three months of trading data. You can't calculate a five-year beta, so you'd have to use a three-month. Or if a company has drastically changed how it's performed comparison to the market recently, then the beta will be different as well um, when for one year versus a five year whereas the five year may no longer be accurate so a little bit um, there as well and i mean lastly what WAC is doing really is it's taking the proportion of debt and the proportion of equity and then the expected rates of those things so the cost of debt it's just going to be the blended interest rate based off the debt that's outstanding and then you apply a little bit of a tax shield um, because the interest is tax deductible so you do get a little bit of a tax shield um, from that perspective. And then you get a blended cost of capital, basically, based off the company's total capital structure. Now, the second method is the hurdle rate, is what I'll call it, but it's really just the rate of return an investor needs. For example, Warren Buffett mentioned in his early partnership days, he used a 10% discount rate because his fund needed to return 10% annually for his investors. So this is more, um, as an investor, what do you need? So. I threw together a little model that we'll jump through and kind of look through some of the drawbacks of um, WAC. But ultimately, you know, I think the big argument we hear is when doing an intrinsic valuation, we want to use WAC to understand the intrinsic value of the company. And then you could imply your own hurdle rate and see, you know, what the difference in valuation is and see what your margin of safety is. Now, I don't really follow this line of thinking. Um, the reason I say this is, say you apply a 5% and you're using WAC and you get a valuation of 300 billion. If the current market cap is 500 or 150 billion, right? So you have 150 billion difference in valuation. You're saying it's undervalued like crazy, um, right? You're saying, oh, there's a lot of room there for errors in my model and I would still get a 5% return. And that's great. But like, if you really need an eight or a 10% return, then uh, you know, having a margin of safety on a 5% doesn't do you any good. You're better off to use the 10% rate you need, see what the present value is there. And if you get a $130 billion valuation with a 10%, you know, discount rate and the current company's currently trading at 150 billion, then, you know, you're saying it's overvalued currently to get you that 10% return. You're not going to touch it. Um, so, you know, it, it's an interesting argument. I don't really follow why you would use the WAC as an investor. Um, I don't think it's incredibly relevant from that standpoint, but let's go ahead and talk about WAC and I'll show you kind of my line of thinking and why I believe that. So the first example here is I've pulled the WAC together for Verizon. Um, I use this because it's a real company so you can see how the beta changes over the period that you measure. 
So here we've calculated WAC using a five-year, four-year, three-year, two-year, and one-year beta, um, which you can see in all these different columns labeled here at the top. So with a five-year, we get 4.3% WAC, and if we use a one-year beta, we get a 5.3% WAC, so a whole percentage point different. Now, you may not think that's very material, but that is incredibly material when you're doing evaluation. That could be the difference of $50, $100 billion in valuation. And this is just purely from when did we select the time period to use as our beta, right? So nothing about Verizon has changed. It's purely just how you calculate its beta. Um, so I think this is the first drawback, right? Some people are like, oh no, WAC is just an input and you just take it and you run the numbers and then you get an output, but there's a lot of assumptions in here still and beta is kind of the first one. And depending on your time frame, it's gonna drastically change your WAC. So the second thing I wanna talk through here is why do we care how much debt they have? So this is a hypothetical example. We have company A without debt in column C and then company A with debt in column D. So what we can see here in column A, right? Equity value of 100. So no debt, no cost of debt. Cost of equity is 8%. The way we calculated this, just you know, expected return in the market, historical S&P return, treasury yield, and then we just gave it a beta of one to keep things simple. All right, cost of equity, 8%. Since there's no debt, there's no tax yield piece, but you get an 8% weighted average cost of capital. Now the enterprise value here is still $100. If you're not familiar with enterprise value, it's kind of the total price to acquire a company, all its outstanding equity, debt less its cash, right? So in this assumption, we're assuming they have 100 of equity, zero of cash, and zero of debt. So that gives an enterprise value of 100. Now, if we add debt onto the company, we'll add $100 of debt at a rate of 5%. So debt is always cheaper than equity for the most part. We end up getting a whack of 6%. So we're saying this company is less risky and we should discount its cash flows less than the company without debt. Now, everything else is exactly the same. Enterprise value is still 100, right? You raise $100 of debt, but you instantly get $100 of cash. Those are going to net out on your balance sheet, and still enterprise value will just be your equity of 100. Now, I think this is counterintuitive. I think if a company has debt and it's highly levered, and in this example, it's 50% levered, um, I think there's a lot more risk there. There's a now a first lien holder that has rights to assets and cash flows in the event of a default or a bankruptcy. Um, but with WAC, we're now saying that this company is less risky and should have less discount to its cash flows than a company without debt. That makes no sense. So right here, I think that's already a big problem with WAC is like we're looking at the capital structure, which I think is pretty irrelevant to how risky the cash flows are. Unless if a company is incredibly levered, then there is some risk there from interest rate risk um, if they can't make their payments there and they could default. So, you know, the third thing I want to talk about is the market risk premium. And so what we have here, um, you know, we're going to calculate it two ways. The first way is how I usually do it. I use the 30 year treasury. Most people will use the 10. I, I use the 30 just because I think the 10 is incredibly low right now. Um, and then the expected return in the market. So this is a historical return in the market. 10.1% is historical return in the S&P 500. And I'll show you where I get this data from. And then we're just still just using a beta of one for keep things simple. Now, the next way we're going to do it is we're going to do it based off uh, Professor Dumaradin's work at NYU. Great professor. Um, really loved in the investing community. People love his DCFs and his academic approach. Um, and he provides us, actually, let me open up this file real quick. He has a file on his website that is going to give us expected return risk premium of the market. And what he has here is at the end of 2020, there is a expected risk premium of 4.72%. And if you add back the risk free rate, that's the expected return in the market, which is 5.65%. And then if we look at from 1960 to 1920 though, it's 10%. So just depending, and even if you do 2011 to 2020, you get 7.7%. So just depending on the time frame you use for your market risk premium, you're going to get a very different number here. Personally, I think you should use just the historical return of the S&P 500, which is, according to this, 10%. And I think that that's a good example, but some people think you should just use the last year's data. So once again, it's another kind of debate here of what's the correct approach. It's two things, right? Nothing different about the companies. Same debt, same equity. The only difference is the cost of equity and the way you calculate it if you use the 
10 year or the 30 year. And then if you use the historical return of the market or you use the last one year's return of the market, everything else is the same. And you get a whack that is almost half. Nothing has changed. No risk profile has changed. Nothing has changed. But we're saying if you use these key, you know, most recent trends here, company is vastly less risky and requires less return. That to me, once again, does not make sense. Now, if we pull this all together, so we pull all three things together. We have the beta, the debt, and the market premium. And we're taking company A, you know, with the 10.1% whack. We add the 100 of debt to it at 5%. And let's adjust the beta as well. Let's say 0.5 beta. It's, you know, been less correlated to the market in the last year for whatever reason. And let's use the 10-year treasury and let's use the last year's expected risk premium of the market. And we get a whack of 3.6%. Now that is about a third, you know, of our scenario A. And nothing about these companies has changed, but we're saying 3.6 versus 10.1. And, you know, that's gonna drive your cash flows and your valuation um, pretty significantly. And I think, you know, something we can do is a recent valuation I pulled together was BMS, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. And let's just look, here's a sensitivity table. And if we put, 3.6 and then what was the other one? 10 point, 3.6 and 10.1. And then we put 10.1, you get a 100 billion to a $540 billion range. And this is still all using WAC, just depending on how you calculate WAC. And it currently trades at about 150 billion. So if you use a 3.6% WAC, you're gonna say, oh wow, they're only trading at $150 billion market cap, my valuation says they should be worth $540 billion. That's crazy. Um, if you use a 10%, now you're saying, oh, they're overvalued. And if you use an 8%, you're saying they're probably fairly valued. Right? So, you know, I think this really highlights the narrative I'm trying to tell, right? People claim WAC is just a given that we have to use. And I don't think they really know what they're talking about. It's very subjective. There's a ton of inputs. And it all just kind of depends on how you tweak some of those and you can get a vastly different weighted average cost of capital. Um, and I think people like to, to hide behind it and say, oh, it's academic and it's rigor and it feels scientific. And I think, you know, there's a lot of assumptions in there still that can be changed to get you the whack you want and to get your valuation where you need it. So, you know, I think as a retail investor, I find the discount rate you should be using is a, is a hurdle rate for yourself. Find something you're comfortable with um, something you think, you know, in your portfolio that you actually want to achieve. Um, if that's the historical return in the S&P 500, right, maybe use this 10%. Um, if it's, you know, you're comfortable not quite keeping up with the S&P 500 for whatever reason, um, which would be crazy to me because you could just invest in the S&P 500 and diversify um, a lot of the risk there. Um, you know, you could do something a little less. Or if you want to beat the S&P 500, you'd pick something like 15%. And, you know, just something to highlight, the higher the rate you go with, the harder it's going to be to find investments. That's a good thing, right? I don't think that's bad. I think that's good. I think in the, the world of value investing, a lot of people are impatient and they want to find the home run today. You know, they want to find the company that's undervalued that's going to take off in the next year. That's simply just not how it works. These opportunities don't come up all the time. Um, and, you know, I think if you... Go listen to some interviews or read some of the letters that Warren Buffett has written in the past. He he says, pretend you have a punch card with 10, 10 punches in it and you can make 10 investments in your entire life. He says something to this extent. And he's like, you can only make 10 investments. That's all you should ever make. Like you don't need to go make 100 investments. You need to make 10, right? And if you're investing for 50 years, right? That means you're making two investments a decade. You're not sitting here turning over your portfolio every year. You make an investment when the price is attractive and you enter the market at that point because you know it's severely undervalued and it's a great company. If you're using a 3% whack or whatever you're using based off the most recent year's data because we're at historic low interest rates and whatever the risk premium is calculated super low right now, you know, you're going to get funny results and you're going to say everything's undervalued when it's really not. So, you know, I think this is an important topic to hit on. Um, and really something to understand. And 
make sure you're comfortable with the discount rate you use because I get a lot of questions of how do you pick your discount rate? And then I started just calculating whack to humor people. Um, and then I saw this post the other day on the internet and someone was saying like, you should always use whack and not hurdle rate. And I was like, this is crazy. Um, so this is my take on it, um, right? So obviously I'm in the, the hurdle rate camp. Um, and there's probably going to be some of you that are in the whack camp and you'll probably comment and tell me I'm wrong and that's fine. Um, I think it creates a healthy dialogue, but I think to think about both sides and understand it. Um, and I think the problem with WAC is it's just so sensitive to the current market conditions that can change rapidly, right? Like we know interest rates are going up. So if we say this is going to go back to three and a half percent in the next two years, all of a sudden, right, your WAC goes up one percent, you entered, now the company's valued less because WAC has gone up just because treasury yields have gone up. You know, I think that's crazy. Um, Pick the hurdle rate you need as an investor to get the return you need to drive the profits in your portfolio that make you happy and make you a successful investor. Um, don't just calculate whack and say it's academic and correct and just something you have to do, at least be able to defend it. Um, so anyways, I appreciate you watching. I hope you found this a little bit informative or useful. Uh, leave any questions you have below. I'm happy to engage in this topic. I think it's a fascinating conversation. Um, so yeah, uh, look forward to it and thanks so much.